Okay, we ready to get started? Okay, yeah. hey, hi, my name is uh, Peter Coppola. I'm a resident of Burlington since 1977. I've been gardening for as long as I can remember. I grew up in Revere and I was surrounded by old Italian guys who had gardens, so I learned from stealing vegetables in the yard and getting in trouble. I learned a lot about gardening. Uh, about 2000, late nine, 1990s, I started writing a gardening article in the local newspaper, and that kind of got caught on. From that, I did a cable show on BCAT called The Wannabe. You know, I want to be Norm Abrams, I want to be Roger Swain, uh, I want to be Jacques Papin, so I did all of these shows, <laughs> and that caught on. Uh, to the point where people were actually stopping me in the street and asking me questions and everything. So I, I went home one night and I said to my wife Janet, listen, if I'm going to expect people to believe what I'm saying, I probably need some kind of credential. Um, so I w signed up and I became a master gardener. That was in 2002. And ever since then I've been teaching these classes and talking and helping and volunteering and all that other good stuff. Tonight we're going to be talking about gardening in the climate change era. No, we're not, but <laughs> we're going to talk about gardening. But the difference between weather and climate, and this is where the debates are all about, weather is what's happening now. Climate is what's happening now over the last 30 years. So it's accumulated data tracking what's going on in the moment. And we do a lot of our gardening based upon how it was done in the past. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. For right now, let's talk about plants. Plants have been on the planet for 1.7 billion years. If we take this planting stick and we call this 1.7 billion years, this is how long modern humans have been on the planet. This is 200,000 years. This is how long modern humans have been on the planet. That's Cro-Magnon, Neanderthal, and modern humans. If we take this and expand it out, the 200,000 years, it would look like this. 190,000 years as hunter-gatherers, just walking and foraging through the woods. About 10,000 years ago, we started establishing communities and farming. So we've been farming for about 10,000 years. And it's only in the last 200 years that we began hybridizing and thought we were smarter than plants. So can you see this little black line right there? That's 200 years. That's how long we've been thinking we're smarter than plants. That 200 years against 1.7 billion years doesn't even show up. So I would argue that plants know a lot more about how to grow and survive on this planet than we do. So we should be taking lessons from the plants and that's what tonight is all about. So let's go through the plant cycle. Plants start out as a seed grows into a parent plant, produces flowers, and then from that, a new seed develops. So it starts out as a seed, and inside every single seed, regardless of the size, and this is your responsibility, it starts with you, so you point everything out as you pass it on and so on and so forth. So inside every plant, every seed, is a baby plant. It's a baby plant, and a baby root. Can you see that right there in the bottom at the base of the plant? Yep. Let's see. And these plants, when they start to grow, turn it, develop two systems. That baby root, which is called a radical, is the root system, and the baby plant is the shoot system. Are you familiar with that expression, shoots and roots? That's where it comes from. And they are complete opposites. Obviously, the shoots are above ground, the roots are below ground. 
but it goes beyond that. The shoots are responsible for food production and reproduction. The roots are responsible for storage and acquisition. They store the food that the shoots create and they acquire nutrients from the soil so the plant can grow healthy and do its production and reproduction thing. And when I talk about reproduction, plants are not here for our viewing pleasure. It has nothing to do with us. Plants are growing to survive, just like we want to survive the plants want to survive. They grow to produce children and pro propagate the species. That's it. Nothing else. And they've been doing this for that 1.7 billion years through five um, tectonic plate movements, five mass extinctions. Mass extinction is when 70% of the exist existing species on the planet die off as a result of, of an event, like the asteroid that killed the dinosaurs. Plants have survived five of those. They've acclimated and they survived all of this. Roots and shoots. The shoot system, vas vascular system is along the outer edge, just underneath the bark. The bark is called an epidermis. Back up. We share 66% of our DNA with plants. A lot of what plants do, we do. <coughs> the only thing we don't share is the ability to make our own food through the process of photosynthesis, which may be good, may be bad, because we would all be green if we shared that. So the shoot system, the vascular system is right here. Nutrients and water go up the outside, it's that thin layer. If you ever peeled back the skin of a, um, of a uh, rose, or when you were pruning the rose or something, it ripped and you can see that light green film, that's the vascular system. So the water goes up the outside of that system and the sugar, which is the food, goes down the inside. The vascular system on the shoots is on the outside, the vascular system on the roots is in the middle. So at this transition point, where the trunk flares out, that's where it transitions and the vascular system goes to the inside. Shoots breathe carbon dioxide, exhale oxygen, roots inhale oxygen, exhale carbon dioxide. And that's important when we start talking about soil and watering. So try to remember that. Roots inhale oxygen. So, you have, the, you have the baby and it's beginning to grow. It germinates, the shoots come up. <clears throat> As the shoots grow, they grow, <clears throat> grow and grow and grow. And each one of these areas where the main stem goes up and something comes off, in this case a leaf, this area is called a node. And what the plant does is it puts some plant cells there and tells them just to mark time. They're called uh, latent meristems. They're just plant cells that are hanging out doing nothing, waiting for a signal to do something. It grows and grows and grows. At some point it says, okay, what I need you to do is become a flower. So those latent meristems produce a flower. On some plants, the flowers are both male and female. On some plants, the flowers are either male or female. On some plants, the flowers are all male, and on another plant, all female. We know that as like the holly plant, male and female plants. So they're all different. In this particular case, this is a squash plant, and who grows zucchini? Of squashes. Do you ever notice at the uh, first few plants you have a zucchini gets to be about three inches long and then rots and falls off? Okay, that's because it didn't get fertilized and we'll talk about that in a little bit.
But if you look at your squash plants especially, you'll see this. Uh, fruit trees, you'll see this. At the base of the female flower is the vegetable. So this is a gourd, and at the base of the female, female flower is a gourd. The male flower is just a stem. Okay, so you pass that around. So that's a male flower, that's a female flower. So as the plant grows, it produces flowers. And then pollination has to take place. Within a species, every pollen from every species is slightly different. So the only thing that can happen is that pollen from a marigold will pollinate a marigold flower. If a zinnia pollen tries to mari uh, pollinate a marigold flower, the flower will say, no, you're not, a, you're not a marigold. And that's true of every single plant. So it has to be of the same species. And that's important when we start talking about hybridizing. So, as I said, some plants um, have male and female flowers. The Plants like the lilies and the daylilies can have the male and the female uh, organs on the same flower. And when you have a, a plant like that where the organs are on the same flower, that is called a perfect flower. So that's what they're talking about when they say it's a perfect flower. It's because everything is there. So if we just peel this back, These are the stamens, and these brown anthers on the top are the, where the pollen is located. And then in the center, it's called a, um, that's the stamen, and then the top of it is a, is a sticky substance. That's where the pollen settles. When the pollen sticks to that and the plant says, oh yeah, I recognize you as being of my species, it accepts the pollen, and the sperm goes all the way down to the bottom, and then right in here is where the egg sac is. So if, if fertilization takes place, pollination and fertilization, two different things. Pollination is the pollen flying all over the place. When the pollen hits its female species and the sperm uh, fertilizes the egg, that's fertilization. And you know you have fertilization when you look at, this is a uh, spring bulb, and you can see that flowers all the way up, but only some of them have pods where the seed are growing. Those were the flowers that were fertilized. That's where the pollination and the fertilization took place. So when you go home and you look at all your things, like your hyacinths and everything with the bells, the pods, you should be cutting them off. They're taking energy from the plant, but that's where, unless you want to save them and then dry them out and plant them in the fall. But that's where your seed pods are. On um, irises and daylilies, the seed pods look like um, pecan nuts. Yeah. Yeah. They look like pecans. Oh. <laughs> Big, long. But that means fertilization took place. The downside of leaving them on the plant is the plant is making sugar. And especially in the case of spring bulbs, you want that sugar to go into the roots for storage for next year's flowers. So if you leave these on the vine, the plant is putting all the energy in here and ignoring storing of fruit, uh, storing of the sugar. Always cut them off. That's a crocosmia. That entire stem. You leave, you leave the leaves, but you cut off the entire flower stem. So right now, while your irises have died back, you should be cutting those stems off. Leave the leaves, but just remove the stem. Your peonies are dying back, cut all the flowers off. It's called deadheading. Remove all of the dead flowers so that all energy now is being stored in the roots. And that energy is done through a process called 
photosynthesis. The plant makes sugar. And the ingredients of that sugar are carbon, oxygen, and hydrogen. They combine together to make sugar. That sugar is stored in the roots and then used by the plant during the day for itself to grow. Plants are the only uh, species on the planet that make their own food. Are we good so far? So, so whenever you see a dying stem, cut it off. You should cut it off. In, no matter what time of year. Correct. Once, once the flower has bloomed, remove it. Now, you also, anybody grow fruit trees, apples? No? Uh, anybody remember growing apples or anything like that? Yeah. Okay. Well, you'll notice is um, after they all bloomed the f late uh, March, all the fruit bloomed. So we had all these flowers on the fruit trees. And then uh, the apples started growing, and the apples get to be about a half inch, three quarters of an inch in size, and then a whole mess of them fall to the ground. Yeah. Those are the apples that did not get fertilized. Those are from the flowers that didn't get fertilized. The zucchini, when it gets that big, it gets rotten and falls off. That's because it didn't get fertilized. Pollination did not take place. Once the male flowers are in full production, then you start getting too many zucchini. <laughs> More, than <you> More than you need. <laughs> Some plants um, require cross-pollination. Like I said, male flower, female flower. Um, some plants have them both on the same tree, like, like fruit, apple trees, and things like that. Some pollination takes place before the flower even opens. So beans, tomatoes, peas, pollination takes place within the flower before it even opens. And that's one of the reasons why you can grow multiple um, tomato plants next to each other and not worry about cross-pollination. The same cannot be said to growing gourds and, and winter and summer squash. Because depending on their species, even though one may be a zucchini and the other may be a pumpkin, if they're from the same species, they'll cross and you'll end up with a green orange zucchini or something like that, which is an inedible. Yes? So the apples that fall off the tree, right, didn't get fertilized. Right. That's a different problem. <laughs> OK, but we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about how to avoid that, because we don't have to spray. We, I mean, you consider that these plants, again, 1.7 billion years without our help, you know, something took place. Plants have their own defense mechanisms. So let's just finish up with this. Yes? So is it true with some of the fruit trees that you have to have two trees? Right, because you, you have to have same species, but male and female, so they cross-pollinate. Just some of them. Because oh, I know plum is like that, right? Yep. Some, just some of them. Uh, another example, you saw that, corn. Have you ever purchased an ear of corn, peeled it back, and had like two rows that didn't have uh, kernels in it? Yeah. That's because the uh, female flower, which is the silk, mm -hmm. didn't get fertilized. So you have a whole area that, that, didn't, that pollination did not take place. They didn't get fertilized, they don't grow. The rest grew because they were fertilized. And inside each of those kernels is a seed, is a corn plant yeah. waiting, waiting to grow. So how does the corn get fertilized? <sighs> the tassels, the pollen is in the tassels. And if you're growing something like corn, anything that's windborne pollination, if you're growing something like corn, a lot of people grow it in rows which is you know, a nice straight row, as in my garden, beautiful. But when the pollen is ready to go airborne and the wind blows this way across the rows, the pollen ends up over there. <laughs> so you need to grow things like, like corn in a big square. So regardless of which way the wind blows, at least a lot of the silk will get pollinated. OK? So the plant goes from seed to plant, to flower, to fruit, to seed. It does that in one growing season. Then the plant dies. What kind of plant is that? Annual. An annual. If the plant grows the first year, 
does not flower, dies back to the ground, comes back the second year, blooms, has its babies, and then dies. What kind of plant is that? Perennial. Biennial. A biennial. Mm -hmm. Takes two growing seasons for the plant to complete its growing cycle. If the plant grows and flowers and dies back, and it does that for at least three years in a row, what kind of plant is it? Perennial. Perennial. Simple, right? Any questions about the plant? Okay. When the plant does it that way, when pollination takes place and the seeds are saved, things like that, to grow the next year, that is called uh, sexual pollination, uh, sexual propagation. But like people, when plants do that over and over and over again, year after year after year after year, there are some genetic variations. And that's how hybridizers got their start 150 years ago. They would literally grow a field of marigolds the size of this room and then walk around all summer long. Which one is taller? Which has a bigger flower? Which has a different color flower? What does not bigger leaves, greener leaves, whatever. And they would capture those seeds, save them, and then try them the next year to see if they get the same thing. That is sexual propagation, which means you'll always get some variation. If you want exactly the same plant year after year, you have to take a cutting or do a division. That's called asexual propagation. Okay? It's only in the last 25 years that hybridizers have gotten fancy and said, well, what if we take something special from this flower that is a different species from this flower and put those genes into this flower, what will it do? And that's what we call GMO. That's what GMO is. So even though hybridizing and there are genetic differences all the time, when you actually take from a different species, because <coughs> species do not cross-pollinate, when you actually take from a different species and put it into a different plant, that's, that's GMO, okay? When the flowers pollinate on their own, airborne, it's called open pollination. When you save the seed of that flower or that vegetable for 100 years, what kind of seeds do we call them? Heirlooms. That's all an heirloom is. Mm -hmm. Nothing fancy about heirlooms. <clears throat> when you take within the same species and you mix two plants together in order to produce a bigger flower or more flowers or bigger greener leaves, that's called a hybrid. And since hybrids do not naturally mix on their own open pollination, if you save those seeds and plant them the following year, only 25% of the plants you seed you sow will give you that same plant. The other 75 will revert back to the mother plant. One year I took a red bell pepper, about, honestly about this big, I was in Spain and it was huge. I saved the seed, I went running back, I said, you're not gonna believe the size of these bell peppers. And I specifically asked the guy, of course I'm speaking English, he's speaking Spanish, and he's open pollinated, he's like, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Came home, planted them, biggest pepper plants you could imagine, jalapenos. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so a plant needs sunlight, water, air, temperature in order to grow. SWAT, if you can remember SWAT, when you have a plant problem and you're out there doing your analysis, that will help you to remember. Sunlight, water, air, temperature. Sunlight stimulates, it's the spark for photosynthesis. Air contains carbon dioxide. Those are two of the ingredients in the sugar that is made during photosynthesis. Water contains hydrogen, that's the third element that's needed to make sugar. And it all has to be done at the correct temperature. Every plant has an optimal growing temperature, optimal photosynthesis temperature. 
Some plants like the cold, and it's based on where they're native to. So some plants like the cold. Lettuce is from Northern Europe. Peas are from Turkey, cold climates. So they like to be planted early in the season, as early as March in the ground. The other end, you have plants like tomatoes and marigolds and squashes. They're primarily from the equator. They like high temperatures. That's why everything is kind of just sitting in the ground right now. It's been so cold, they've germinated, but they just, man, it's just too cold to do anything. Next week, it's going to go into the 80s. You, you'll see these plants take off. But for right now, they're sitting there too cold. So plants that enjoy cooler temperatures are referred to as what kind of plants? Cooler temperatures. <laughs> cool season plants. Warm season plants. Cool, warm. They have optimum growing temperatures. The temperature is about a 10 degree range. And when the temperature changes and it gets hot, those cool season plants say, no more. I can't handle it. And I probably have finished my life cycle in terms of growing, so I think I'll have babies. So next week, you have lettuce plants are going to start tasting bitter. And then you're going to see this big center thing come shooting out of the center of the lettuce plants. That's a seed stalk. It's called bolting. And it's going to go to seed because it's saying, I'm at the end of my growing season. So before I die, I have to have children. So it sends out a seed head. That's all it's about. OK? Can you do anything to kind of delay that? No, you can start earlier. <laughs> <laughs> you, you really can't. So you're seeing, if you go to the nurseries now, they're giving away uh, lettuce plants because in, in another two weeks, they're going to begin to taste bitter. And it's, that's. That's the plant's mechanism. Plants have their own, and we're going to talk about it a little later, they have their own defense mechanisms. So when it's ready to go to seed, it's ready to have babies, it's saying, I don't want anybody to eat any of me because I need all the energy to feed my, my eggs. So it gets bitter tasting, so you will not eat it. Conversely, at the other end, say something like an apple or a green pepper, it says, I'm not ready to have my seed go out and grow and, and populate itself. So it keeps the poisons in the apple, which is why if you eat a green apple, not a Granny Smith, if you eat a green apple, you get a stomach ache. That's the toxins in the apple. If you eat a green pepper, which is not a ripe pepper, pepper green peppers ripen into yellow or red or brown. So if you eat a green pepper, you're burping peppers all day. But if you wait for it to ripen and you eat a red pepper, it's nice and sweet and you don't have that problem because you didn't eat any toxins. Any questions about plants? Yeah? So if you plant lettuce in like May or into May, it just won't grow? No, it's, it's growing. It'll continue to grow. But toward the end of um, this month now, you're going to see this, the center of the lettuce that's getting taller and the leaves get further and further apart? I planted my lettuce way too late. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I'm probably not going to get any lettuce. No, save, save what you have left for seed and plant them at the end of July, and you'll have a fall crop when it gets cool again. Oh, OK. Because it is a cool season plant. Yeah. Yeah. Or eat them, eat them as a little tiny lettuce piece. <laughs> By the way, um, a lot of what we grow as flowers are also edible. So if you want to add some color to your salad, this is perfectly edible. What are they? These are day lilies. Oh, day yeah. All day lilies? Yes. Oh. yes. Want to taste it? They're really good. I do. Thank you. They're really good. Pass it around. Taste it. Take a bite if you want. Um, mm. Yeah, Paul. I have a question. When I get my cucumber seeds, yes. they're all green except for a few yellow in there. And they say, make sure when you plant that you at least plant one yellow. Oh, yeah, take a piece off. What does that have to do with I have no idea. Okay, yeah, I don't either. I just follow the directions. <laughs> well, that's good. That's good you follow directions. It's always nice to know that. All right, yes? We've been getting some blight on cucumbers in the past years. What's a good way to kind of handle that? 
We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Okay. okay? Can you change the color by adding what? I don't know. <laughs> no. No. It's, what, what you can hope for with daylilies is that um, you could, some cross-pollination takes place or you cross-pollinate yourself and then put a bag over the flower so that no other pollen. So you take like um, the pollen from a red daylily and spr sprinkle it on the stamen of the yellow and then cover it, you'll get a hybrid. It's a lot of work, but you can save, then save the seed and hope for it. All right. Yes. Why are some squashes you don't get female flowers? Last year I had a bunch of... We lost them from the same place. There's no, there's, that should not be... So you get all male flowers? That should not, well, you may have had a chipmunk eating the females. So you may have had a cheap chipmunk um, enjoying your, your little baby squashes. Right, so you probably had a chipmunk. The chip, you look, look out in your yard now, the chipmunks are just to climb right up the stem and eat the buds. Yeah. So we're going to talk about that way back there in about an hour and a half. All right, so, yes. That's, that is what is going on now with the weather. Okay. So there's nothing I can do about No, no. What this is... This hydrangeas that you get no flowers. I'm going to talk about that right now. So what we have is, uh, we talked about annuals and biennials and now perennials. We have, and we talked about the upper, I mean the grow, happy growing temperatures. So above that temperature, the plants get too hot and don't do anything. They completely stop growing. There's also a lower temperature called the hardiness temperature. And that dictates the type of perennials you can buy. We live in a zone 6A. That's our hardiness zone. That each zone number is, is 5 degrees Fahrenheit lower. So as the zone number goes down, the temperature goes down. The coldest winter temperature goes down. So we live, we live in a zone 6A. Weather-wise, our temperatures have been more like the Cape Cod, which is a zone 7. But winter-wise, we've had some really cold days. So what happens is plants like your hydrangea that used to be okay during the winter in zone six, even though they're a, labeled a zone six plant, because we haven't had snow cover as a blanket, and because the temperatures have been really dipping on certain days, the flower buds that are set on the plant in the fall freeze and die during the winter, and you don't get flowers. You also notice the last couple of years, the hydrangeas are not those dead sticks that we used to have, right? Mm -hmm. The leaves would come out all along those yes, sticks. Yes. Now they're all coming from the ground, right? All the sticks are dead every year. That's winter kill because our temperatures are dropping below what used to be the traditional zone 6A temperature. And that's what all the climate change deniers are saying. See, see, it's cold, cold, cold. But the reality is our average daily temperatures yearly have gone up. Yeah, Paul. Well, that keeps the, the roots warmer, but it's the stems that are exposed to the cold. So if you want to try to protect your hydrangeas and have them bloom on those existing stems, you actually have to put a tent around it, fill it with some styrofoam and leaves, cover it with a piece of plywood so water doesn't get into it, and then take that all apart in the spring. Well, they have to now because all the growth comes up from the base. Yeah, I thought it was like, like the Nico blue one is that it said there was uh, some third of it that was supposed to be old growth, but that's what you're talking about. It's, it isn't. Right. It doesn't bloom off. They, that's all dead now. Okay. We, gotta, we have to keep moving. <laughs> okay. So sunlight, water, air, temperature. Does a plant need soil in order to grow? 
No. Wrong. We have hydroponics. It's just if you want to be a no maintenance gardener, the best place to grow plants is in the soil. So you, need, you do need soil, but you can grow plants without the soil. That's why it doesn't say swats. It says swat. <laughs> and what all soil is is crushed rocks. That's three billion years of the continental plates smashing against each other, separating volcanoes, um, earthquakes, asteroid strikes, and bang, 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 the rock gets smaller and smaller and smaller. And they finally get down to a size that we call soil. And the three sizes of rock that we grade within soil is sand. You can see that's like a building sand. All right, now because you're on this end, your job is to put the right covers back on the jar on the correct jar. And you will be tested. The next smallest size is silt. Pass it around, touch it, feel it. You get some people behind you. Make sure everybody sees it. Silt. <laughs> and the smallest size is clay. And clay is so small that you can actually see if it goes airborne. Clay, when you touch it, it feels like talcum powder. This is crushed rock that is so small. It's like, that's silt. Silt is like a, a, a playground sand, that size. Okay, and this is clay. When you combine those three together, if you have any amount of those three together, you have loom. So this is loom. It's just sand, silt, and clay mixed together. Okay, so what's miss what is what is missing in the sand, silt, and clay? The brown stuff. Which is who said it? Organic material. There's a test. Um, you have this, do you have this in your handout? It's a soil triangle. And what you do is you take a um, couple of shovelfuls of loom from your yard, stir it all together, put it in a plastic jar, fill the jar up halfway with the soil, fill the rest of the jar up with water, shake it like crazy, get it spinning like crazy, all of that, and what you'll see is the, let it settle, the sand will fall to the bottom, the silt will go to the middle, the clay will be on top, and all your organics will be on top of that. So you measure the total height of the sand, silt, and clay, and then the height of each individual component. You divide, the, the numerator is the smaller number, the denominator is the bigger number, and that gives you a percentage. Do not open this jar, just pass it around the way it is. Don't let it get mixed up. And then you go to your triangle that's in your handout, and it's just a percentage. So you go, the percentage of sand, you find whatever that number is, and draw a line perpendicular to that. Go to your silt and draw a line perpendicular to that. Go to your clay, draw a line perpendicular to that, and what you're going to be left with is a small triangle within the big triangle. And that will tell you what kind of soil you have. And what you're, you're targeting is what they call a clay E soil. So, Peter, that's got organic material in it, right? Correct. So, your soil, don't open it. <laughs> your soil at home has organics in it. So, that's, you're going to see something like that when you do it. So, you're shooting for a clay E soil. I got a question for you. Yes. Yeah. I, get, I make my soil strictly out of mulch stuff leaves. Right. And uh, kitchen waste products. Yep. Would this test apply to the, the soil I have in my yard? No, because that's just strictly, strictly compost, and we'll talk about compost later. Sand, silt, and clay are the inorganic pieces. Inorganic. The stuff that you are composting is the organic element. 
Well, let's just quickly talk about this. This is one cubic foot of soil. This is what one cubic foot of soil looks like. It's actually an Ajax box, but it's one cubic foot. This is what 12 by 12 by 12. All of the activity takes place here with microbes. If you have a healthy soil, and by healthy I mean a lot of organic matter, if you have a healthy soil, then this size would literally contain hundreds of trillions of microbes. Hundreds of trillions, upwards of 60,000 different species. And that's everything from little viruses and bacteria all the way up to earthworms. The ratio of good to bad microbes is 30,000 to one. So part of your problem with the blight is that your one is too uh, populated in, in this, which means you need to get more compost, more organic material into your soil so that the good guys beat up the bad guys. And that's how it's been working for 1.7 billion years. The root system has developed a relationship with the microbes and the microbes take care of the plant. Not to gross you out, but we are all carrying about three quarters of a quart of microbes in and on our body. And if it wasn't for those microbes in and on our body, we would not be alive. You know, when they talk about probiotics and prebiotics, those are microbes. That's bacteria. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be healthy. If it wasn't for the microbes in the soil, our plants would not be healthy. Okay? Can you have too much of the organic? Well, some of the super pro-organic growers will tell you you do. I, I don't think you can, but you definitely need to have some sand, silt, and clay, inorganic matter mixed in with it. Okay, you, should, you still need that. Now, that happens when we, and I'll explain that when we talk about water, why, that, why that's important, okay? So topsoil, this is, this is from my yard. Uh, we used to have an above ground pool and a lot of sand underneath the pool. So when the pool got a hole in it, 20 years, you're out of here. So this is just the sandy soil that was under my pool loaded up with organic matter. Yes, I just added compost, 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 cow manure, whatever I can get my hands on. And then this is from my vegetable garden. So when you're passing that around, what you'll notice is some little shiny specks. That's the sand, silt, and clay. The dark brown is the organic matter. The shiny specks are the sand, silt, and clay. And if you take a sniff of that, you're, you're going to notice there's no, no foul odors or anything like that. Any questions about soil? Yes? Since I made my garden strictly uh, ground up leaves and, and uh, compost, should it be adding it? Should it be adding sand? No, what you need to do is take a shovel yep. and just dig down below that and bring that sand or clay or whatever's underneath and incorporate it into your compost. Just, just uh, years ago, there was a thing called the French double dig. We actually dug a trench, put it in a wheelbarrow, went to the other end of the, of the planting bed. Then you, you uh, dug out the sand that was underneath that, put it out. Then you take the, the next, go over a foot, take the topsoil, throw it into the bottom, take the sand that's underneath, put it on top of that, and just work your way down. So it's called a double dig. So I mean, do that, or what we do in the in the community garden is, is a couple of beds a year, I just dig down and incorporate all the compost into the, the sand that we got there. Well, since I have a raised garden, that's gonna be a little bit of a challenge. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. You just wanna, the roots go down to the, to the sand and clay down below, into the inorganic field, but um, you still want to incorporate it. And again, when we talk about watering, you'll understand why. Okay. And this is important because the root system as I said, has a relationship with these microbes. So the roots contain the sugar, 
and the microbes know where the elements are that a plant needs to grow. We call plant nutrients. So the relationship is, hey, you find me some elements and I'll give you some sugar. Because the bacteria cannot make its own food. So the plant feeds the bacteria and the bacteria in turn finds the nutrients for the plant to grow. So it is so important to have a healthy soil for the plant to grow on its own. Any questions about soil? Yeah, Paul. Worms. Yep. How do you get them to populate? Just organic. Just get more and more organic. The more organic material you put in the soil, the, the more the worms will come and, and eat. eat. They're the first thing that breaks. They're the primary decomposters okay. out of worms. They break down the large material so that the smaller microbes and bugs and everything can, can feed on it. But you have to have it there. If you don't have organic material, you know, I charge people say, oh, I bought worms. I was just going to say, can you, you know, buy, worms? buy worms and put them in the yard. Well, that's great, but if you don't have any food to the worms to eat, oh, okay. they're not going to stick around. <laughs> they're going to go find the food. Same thing with predatory insects. Oh, I bought a jar of ladybugs. That's great, but if you don't have an insect problem. <laughs> they'll go someplace else. Exactly. So Any more? Yeah. Is yeah. the manure the best organic thing you use to put in there if you don't compost? Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of things. Um, I compost, but you can also use peat moss. Uh, but if you're an environmentalist today, you know, you don't want to use peat moss because this is what they call carbon sequestration. So when you release, you dig up the peat moss and you turn it into your soil, you're releasing carbon into the atmosphere. So you shouldn't be using peat moss. And then this is, this is uh, my compost, from my compost bin. Is composting difficult? Are you going to go into that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So uh, yeah, manures are great. What you don't want to do is spend your money on, on potting soil. Because all you're doing is buying peat moss and sand, silt, and clay with some, with some fertilizer included. So you're wasting, if you just buy potting soil or potting mixes, you're, waste, you're wasting money. If you just buy this, you know, you, whoop, you're wasting money. Because if you read the ingredients, which is right here, made from uh, core pith fiber, which is, which is uh, the fiber that's inside a coconut, peat moss, and forest products, which is stuff that decomposed in the forest. And then, and then a bunch of fertilizer, so right there. So always read the ingredients, but you're, waste, you're not wasting your money, but if you purchase things like cow manure and peat moss, it's a bigger bang for your buck than, than buying potting mix. And the only difference between potting mix and potting soil is that the potting mix contains no sand, silt, and clay, whereas the potting soil is um, the stuff that is scraped up from, say, the cow paddocks, where they're picking up some sand, silt, and clay, and it gets mixed in. So they have to, even though it's a very small amount, because it contains some sand, silt, and clay, it has to be called a potting soil. And that's the only difference. Okay? Oh, how are we doing? Good? All right. So let's put it all together. Sunlight, water, air, temperature. You have this great soil. The soil is where the roots acquire the water, but the soil is also where the roots breathe. So you need to create an environment where there are air pockets in the soil. That's why, uh, are you familiar with the expression heavy soil, light soil? These are old uh, farmers, rule of thumbs. What the farmers would do is pick up a handful of soil and squeeze it and feel it and everything. And if it contained a lot of clay, so if they squeezed it and it just stayed as a clump, and they kind of pressed it around and they didn't see a lot of, of larger particles of soil, that was called a heavy soil because it did, didn't have a lot of air pockets in it. If it contained um, a lot of sand, 
and they could see it, that contained a lot of air pockets, so the same volume of soil, sandy soil, is lighter than a volume of clay soil. Heavy soil, light soil. That's where that expression comes from. Okay? So, in order to make all of this work, we need water. Water, when we water our plants, and this is really critical because how many people know we have a permanent water restriction program in town? Permanent. Plants, if you have a healthy soil that contains a lot of organic material in it and you space your plants correctly, you only need one inch of water per week. If you familiar with that? You see that on every planting label. Give it one inch of water per week. And we're, gonna, we're going to talk about that. When you water, one of four things happens. When you first water and the soil is dry, the water runs off. And usually as it is running off, it gets a little coating of dust around it. That's the clay particle sticking to the water. And the water runs off. Some of the water percolates into the soil and goes all the way down into the aquifer. Some of the water, when the sun comes up and it gets hot, evaporates into the air, into the atmosphere, and some of the water goes through the roots and through the plant, and that's called transpiring, and it comes out through the leaves. If you've ever uh, walked in the forest on a hot, hot day, but you go into the woods, you get all sweaty, but you're nice and cool, that's the trees misting you. That's the water going through the plant and then coming out of the leaves. So it's misting you. That's transpiration. So one of four things happen. Our job as gardeners is to try to eliminate runoff. And you do that by setting up berms, leveling the soil. Do whatever you can to prevent water from running away and down the street and into the storm drain. And we want to reduce percolation. And you do that by, again, incorporating as much organic material as you can into the soil. And you want to reduce evaporation. So what you do is water early in the morning, before 9 o'clock, or late in the afternoon after 4 o'clock, but before, say, 6 o'clock, so that the plants are dry before they go to sleep. That's important because if you have wet plants on a warm summer night when it's dark out, that's where all your diseases go crazy. So you would never put a baby to bed with a wet diaper because they'll get a rash, right? You don't let a plant go to sleep with wet leaves. You make sure you stop watering around 6 o'clock so it will dry off before it goes to sleep. So now let's talk about the type of water. What happens is when you water, the first thing that happens is the water molecules will chemically bind to your sand silver clay. That's a chemical reaction. That's the strongest bond there is. Okay? The second thing they'll do is um, magnetically attach to each other. So the water molecules stay together. And this is why when you water, when you first water and the water runs off, all the water keeps following because the water is magnetically attracted to itself. Okay? So you want this to, these guys to stick around. They're going to be attached to your sand, silt, and clay. And if you have a sandy soil like this, and they're far apart, the bond breaks, and that's the water that goes down into the aquifer. So you want this water to stick around in between the sand, silt, and clay particles. You want this water to stick around. That's why you do organic material. What you're trying to create is what they call aggregates. <laughs> I was at a garden 
club a couple of years ago, and I pulled these out in the late, and one of them said, I gotta make those? <laughs> this is a blow up. You know when you first turn your soil in the spring and then you rake it out, you have these little, little clumps, like little, little tiny peas? That's sand, silt, and clay and organic material all uh, magnetically attached to itself. So what you're trying to do is create these aggregates where you have your inorganic material and your organic material. So when you first water your, your soil, your inorganic material gets wet chemically. That water is not available to the plants. Then your organic material will absorb the water and then collectively they'll suspend water molecules amongst themselves, but because of their configuration, there's always air pockets. And that's the air that the roots need to breathe. So you want to create an environment like this in your soil. And that's why you put a lot of organics in, and that's why you mix the inorganic sand, silt, and clay with the organic. And you see, because they're irregular shape, they don't st stack up. So that's what you're trying to create in your soil. And you only create that by adding a lot of organic material into the soil. Good? OK. One inch per week. How do you calculate that? You have the formula in your handout. In Burlington, with our head pressure, if you were to take a two gallon pail and turn on your garden hose and fill that, that two gallons up, it will only take about 12 seconds. Work that out, it works out to about 10 gallons of water a minute. You take your growing area and you measure your growing area in feet. In this case, this is a lawn 25 feet by 50 feet. So you multiply that 25 feet by 50 feet, that's uh, 1,250 feet. In order to convert that to square feet, in order to convert that to square inches, you need to multiply times 144. And that will give you square inches, works out to 180,000 square inches. In order to make that volume, you multiply it times one. So you go from a flat to a a volume that's 180,000 cubic inches. And again, you have all these numbers in your handout. There are 231 gallons, uh, cubic inches in a gallon. So if you divide the 180,000 by 231, you get roughly 800 gallons of water that is needed for a planting area that size. You divide that by 10, or in this case, I divided it by 8, and then divided that by 60 uh, minutes in an hour, and that comes out to uh, like one and a half hours of water to give you one inch of water, of watering, to give you one inch of water in an area this size. Okay? Derate that, say you only have five gallons, five gallons a, a minute, which is very, the, half of what you cut out of the faucet right now. That's like two and a half hours of watering a week. Because you only need one inch per week. So in two and a half hours with your sprinkler system on, you will have watered this area enough to satisfy it for a week. Why is that important to know? Because during the summer, we double our daily consumption of water in this town. Double. We go from 2.6 million gallons of water a day to 5.2 million gallons of water a day. And it's all because of people watering their lawns. For an hour a day, every day, rain or shine, the sprinklers are on, they're wasting water. Right now, year to date, well, just this past week alone, seven, the last seven days, we've had one inch of water, of rainfall. We've had one inch of rain. There was no reason for anybody 
to be watering their lawns or their flower beds or anything the past week because we received one inch of water. A week. For the year, this is week 26, we've had 24 inches of rainfall, of, of um, no, rain and snowfall. A week, that's all you need. Is that from January 1st? Yes, from January, 26 weeks, we've had 24 inches of rain. Wow. Well, that's good. Last year, we were four inches ahead of schedule. We actually got over more than 50 inches of rain, uh, 50 inches of rainfall, one inch per week last year. A couple of years before that, we had just the opposite. We had, we've had some serious droughts, right? right? And you probably noticed your lawns maybe had some like shallow areas, your lawn kind of dropped. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because the inorganic material, the sand, silt, and clay got dry, so there was no magnetic attraction to keep the aggregates whole and they collapsed. And you saw the soil just collapse because everything just dried out and it all collapsed. Mm. So one inch of water per week. Figure it out. Figure out your size of your garden, your flower beds, your lawn, and estimate how much water, you, uh, how much water, and then convert it to how much time you need the sprinkler to run. And again, it's only a couple of hours. So I mean, it just drives me crazy, especially yesterday in the rain, watching a business with the sprinkler system running. And I'm, there's no way I'm going to knock on a neighbor's door and say, "Oh, by the way," because I so I want them to be my neighbors, but. <laughs> You know, so just, just bear that in mind. Any questions about watering? Okay. So plants have, if you have a healthy soil full of, of um, organic material and hundreds of trillions of microbes, you pretty much are on your own. The plants don't need you. But if you're growing tomatoes, you have to have the biggest tomato in the neighborhood. You have to produce more tomatoes than anybody else in the neighborhood. You've got to give everybody a zucchini. On and on and on. And the way you do that is by adding fertilizer. Okay? But if we take a look at a plant's nutritional requirements, what do you notice about the first three? These, these are the elements that are in a plant. And where, where does the plant get those three elements? The soil. Oxygen, hydrogen come from the air. Yeah. yeah. The air. Hydrogen doesn't come from the air. Different color. Comes from the water. Oh. Carbon and oxygen come from the air. Hydrogen comes from the water. Collectively, that's 96% of a plant's nutritional needs wow. right. come from air and water. This year was a good year for that. The next three, the one that's highlighted in yellow, is nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Yeah. That's what, uh, little, just a little under 4% of a plant's nutritional needs. These are called the macronutrients. The macro what? Macronutrients. This is what you spend all that money on when you, when you buy fertilizer. Okay. If we draw, if we highlight that, So all of this, all of this comes from the air and water. This little bit here in green is 4%. This is what we spend $75 billion a year on. And it's us. It's not the, it's not the production farms. We are the ones that abuse things like fertilizer and pesticides and herbicides. We do. $75 billion. We spend more money on fertilizer. I mean, we purchase so much that domestic manufacturing plants cannot produce enough. We have to import fertilizer just for this little bit. Okay? But if you're going to buy fertilizer, recognize what you're getting. Fertilizer produced in a manufacturing plant is um, just crushed rocks 
where whatever process, electrolysis, whatever, the elements are separated and they were mixed together. And this is, this is the fertilizer you typically purchase in a store. Take a whiff of that. If you want to touch it and lick it, it tastes salty. And there's a reason for that. And we'll talk about it. That's the typical fertilizer. That, that's what you put in. And you add every three or four weeks, you keep fertilizing with that. Or you have, when you first plant, you have a, a water-soluble fertilizer, which is a, makes itself immediately available to the plant. Who's putting the covers on? You are? <laughs> so she gave up, and now you are being tested. And then if you grow uh, plants in a, um, in a container, you probably use a slow-release fertilizer. And that you, you mix in, and that breaks down over the course of the summer. The problem with fertilizer, the problem with fertilizer is that it is in the form of a salt. So you're not putting in phosphorus, you're applying phosphate. Nitrogen is nitrate. It's the form of a salt. This is what's going on inside a plant. Under normal growing conditions, the, the plant is saltier than the soil. And the way the roots absorb water into the plant is through a process called osmosis. And the direction of flow, and this is just like in our lungs, the direction of flow is from a concentration of low concentration of salt to a higher concentration of salt. So in normal conditions, the plant is saltier than the soil and the water flows into the plant. However, when you apply fertilizer, if you put in too much fertilizer, you stop osmosis or in some cases reverse osmosis. So if you over fertilize, you could actually kill your lawn. How many times have you seen people, right, Oh yeah, I had a friend. Oh yeah, I had, that's 10,000 square feet. So I bought a 15,000 square foot bag because I figured they, they underrate where you're spreading. So I put 15,000, Mike, you killed your lawn. <laughs> we over fertilize. We abuse it, we over fertilize. Okay, but even if we uh, use fertilizer, we have this thing called pH. You have this chart also. pH stands for potential hydrogen. This is another test that the farmers used to do. If you have um, hydrogen ion, if you have a lot of potential hydrogen ion in the soil, your soil is acidic. Okay, and I made this, this chart colored like the, like the uh, swimming pool pH thing. So if you have um, low potential hydrogen ions, you have um, alkaline soil. Okay, but look at all of the elements. You see how the bands get narrow at the ends, but as you approach neutral pH, they get real wide. That is the ability of your plants to intake these elements. So if you have a very low acidic soil or a very high alkaline soil, the plants cannot take up the elements. You follow? Right. Under normal conditions in New England, if we did nothing other than add compost to our soil, we are always slightly acidic. We're right in the sweet zone. Okay? Acidic soil is sour, alkaline soil is bitter. So when the farmers used to scoop that soil up, heavy soil, light soil, then they would lick it. And if it tasted sour, they knew it was acidic and you needed to add lime, you needed to sweeten the soil. 
They probably never tasted anything bitter in our soil because that's more like the Pacific Southwest. It's a very alkaline area. So we tend to be more suffering from acidic soil. So we have bitter soil. This is the old, the old detective stories, right? Mm -hmm. Watson, what do you deduce from that? Hmm, Holmes, I smell almonds. He's been poisoned. <laughs> That's the, all of our alkaloids, all of our poisons come from here. So we need to create this. Okay? Are we good? You, suddenly you guys all went quiet. <laughs> If you want to do like the old farmers, yeah. lick, the, lick the soil. Um, <laughs> or you can get a kit. Um, or you can waste money. Or you can waste money. <laughs> you can buy a meter. You don't want to waste your money. This, this, is a, this one does uh, fertility, light, moisture, and pH. Well, I can just look up and see if I see any light. And I know if it's raining. <laughs> so this was, and fertility is just, it, it just measures the amount of salt. So if you, if you got a lot of salt in there, it's going to go, woo! <laughs> so don't, don't waste your money on one of these. But, um, you know, for 8 or $9, you can get a pH meter. Yep. And for a little bit more, you can get a pH moisture meter. And that's like $11. Those are worth the money. So you can do something like this. And it's not, yep. If, it's, if it is alkaline, yeah. you, need to, you need to lower it. Um, aluminum sulfate? Yeah, aluminum sulfate. Yeah, muriatic acid, that lowers it. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think if you, if you, um, Wood from your wood stove, not coal from the coal stove, but wood ash. We'll, we'll, that'll really drop it real quick. <laughs> if, you, if you got rid of your pool, <laughs> just be careful because stuff like that goes boom the other way and it drops it significantly. So you want to be careful. But yeah, because that's, you read the ingredients on what makes it, what it is that's in there. And it probably is something like ammonium sulfate or something like that. So you can do this, or you can do the pool filter, the litmus test, because they get those litmus strips. So you can, do, you can do it that way, and that will estimate your pH. If you're absolutely um, concerned about what may be in your soil, then take a sample and send it out to uh, UMass and have them do a soil test for you. They were only about $30. So, I mean, if you're really concerned or you don't have a clue what's going on, they, they start around $30, and depending on what you're asking for, it can go up and up. So you can do a meter, or just compost. So let me finish here, and then we're going to talk composting. So if you don't want to buy all those chemicals, and if you don't want to change the amount of salt that's in the soil, you can make your own. And you have this formula in your handout. This is a coffee-based organic fertilizer. All you have to do is go to Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks and ask them for the, or oh, make coffee. Just save your coffee grounds. So you have that formula in your handout and that is 100% organic. The coffee, the coffee grounds are acidic, but they're loaded, all seed is loaded with nitrogen. So you got a huge amount of nitrogen in the coffee grounds, but it's acidic, so you need to add some lime to raise the pH. Okay? But you could also put bone meal and blood meal, which is also 100% organic. Mix it all in there. So you can make that yourself, or you can waste money and purchase it. Either way, it's organic. Get the difference between Manufactured and organic is your NPK is a lot lower. And by NPK, 
All fertilizers, when you purchase a fertilizer, all fertilizers have these three numbers. Mm -hmm. And these, these are your macronutrients. So this is your nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and phosphorus. Every, every bag has to have these three numbers on it. If there is a number greater than zero in all three of these, that is called a complete fertilizer. If any one of these is zero, that is an incomplete fertilizer. But here's the killer. This is an all-purpose fertilizer 677. So that's 6% 6 nitrogen, 7% phosphorus, 7% uh, phosphate, 7% potassium. So that's 14, 6 is 20. So this is 20%, this bag, 20% macronutrients, 80% stuff. Filler. Could be crushed paper, cardboard, sawdust, sweepings from the floor of the manufacturing plant, whatever. It's filler. So you're just buying a bag of stuff in order to get 20% fertilizer. This is um, ideal tomato food. Look, it says right there, ideal tomato food. <laughs> so this is 8108. So that's 26% fertilizer and 74% stuff. And back then, it didn't only, <laughs> it shows you how old I am, it's only cost $4. <laughs> <laughs> how long time A long time, that's a long time. But here's the other thing. Do you think that your tomato plants know you're using the ideal fertilizer instead of the tomato fertilizer, all purpose, for, instead of the ideal? You think they know? There's absolutely no difference. How are we doing, good? Okay. So what you're trying to do, what you're trying to do is to create an environment where you have a lot of air in the soil, where you have enough materi organic material mixed into the soil so that your microbes are happy, while at the same time having a lot of air pockets so the roots can breathe. And by the way, that's, that's what happens you know, when, you tr when you walk the same path in your lawn or in a playground over and over and over again, eventually it turns brown. It's not because you're just trampling the, the shoots, you're also crushing the roots and, and getting the air out of the soil so the roots can't breathe. That's why it dies. So you're creating that environment and you want it to all be within the sweet spot of the pH. And the way to do that is to load your soil up with organics and you have so much at home that we're throwing out. I read today that Burlington only recycles 34% of its waste products. The article was in the newspaper, not our newspaper. Um, but the worst part was, was one of the commenters who, I was reading the paper online, who said, well, we used to throw our stuff away because we had leach fields and, and cesspools and we didn't want that to clog the leach field, but then we got um, garbage disposal, so now we throw it all in the garbage disposal because we have storage and garbage disposals. And I'm like, so instead of fertilizing your yard because you're concerned of backing up your toilets, you're sending it to Winthrop, and which is driving up the cost to, to treat the water. The, but they thought they were doing a wonderful thing because they weren't clogging the toilets. It just makes no sense. We should be. Who composts? How many people do compost? I want to. <laughs> OK. The compost went around. You just smell the compost isn't bad. No. So everybody should be composting. There's no reason why you shouldn't have a compost bin or just a pile. You don't need to have a formal bin. You don't need to buy tumblers or anything like that. I cold compost. And what cold composting means is I just pile everything up and I let it sit there for several months. And I have two compost piles. So I spend the entire summer filling up one compost pile while I'm harvesting from the other. 
And then in the fall, this one is empty. So I start filling this one up and I, with all of the yard waste from the fall and throughout the winter, and then in the spring I harvest that compost pile. So I just go back and forth. No work that way. It's cold, cold composting. But I just keep going like that. John sells uh, composting bins for like $40 a piece. But there's, there's, you can buy composting bins, you can buy tumblers. Mm -hmm. And what a lot of people don't realize, they, they read and it says, oh, you fill it in here and 10 days later, yeah. and you, you can take it out there and you can just keep filling it. No. You fill it up, you tumble it for 10 days, you harvest, and then you fill it up again, which means that all of your kitchen scraps and everything that you accumulated for 10 days has to sit in a bucket somewhere before you refill the tumbler. But you never keep filling up the tumbler every single day and hope to, to take compost out the other end. Because you're always going to end up with a banana that's only a peel that's only a day old <laughs> coming out the other end. That's hot composting. There's, there's two different types, cold composting, hot composting, two schools of thought. The people who believe in hot composting believe that the temperature of the compost pile gets up so high that it kills the seed. The baby plants that are in the seed, especially the weed seed, it kills all of the weed seed. So they prefer the hot compost. But what that also does is it gets so hot that it kills the microbes that the microbes or break down the food that you're throwing into the pile. Cold composting, the temperature never really gets up to the point where uh, you kill all of the seed, but it does enough damage. And again, no work, right? No maintenance, don't want to do any work. So the question is, what can you compost from your house? Anybody? Well, give me some examples. Huh? Well, one at a time. One at a time. Wait a minute. Let me find the eggshell first. All right, eggshells. Somebody said tea bags. Tea bags, along with the little tag and along with the little staple. Don't worry about it. What else? Coffee. Coffee in the coffee filters. What else? Fruits and vegetables. What else? Paper towels. Oh and napkins. What else? Toothpicks. That's wood. What else? You can you can compost that. Hmm? Hey, carton. Oh yeah. This is paper. So if you can do this, what else can you do? Probably. Instead of sending your financial records um, to the, right? And oh, yeah. Throw them through the shredder. Your monthly reports from the banks and everything, throw them through the shredder, <laughs> compost them. <laughs> what else? Oyster shells, fish shells, skins and everything. Yeah, cork. anything. Cork. This is wood. This is, cork is the bark of a tree. It's organic. Wow. So this is, you can do champagne. You can do wine. And you can do my favorite kind of wine. <laughs> Capola wine. <laughs> I gotta keep I gotta keep my cousin happy. What else can you do? How about lint from the dryer? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So if you have the if you use um, the the what do they use? <laughs> I don't know what <laughs> Wouldn't we fill up like downy and... Right, the fabric softeners? It's okay to be in there? Yeah, this, this is what gets caught in the filter. Right. This is the cotton and the it's wool all the time. that comes off your, your clothes, right. right? Your polyester stays on the clothes, but, right. but the wool and the cotton comes off. 100% organic. Okay. So if you know that's the case, then how about... What you do is you, you cut the socks into rings and then you make them into ties. So you tie up your dahlias and your tomatoes and all your other plants and then in the fall all you have to do is pick everything up and throw it in the compost pile. 100% cotton. 
And that's strictly white socks? Is that, uh, this'll, this'll disappear in six months. <laughs> on a warm, on a warm uh, summer day, yeah. uh, warm summer, it'll only take a couple of months. Even though you're cold composting, the top will still be whatever you're throwing in, but if you take, to go down like a couple of inches, you'll have a nice pile of, of compost underneath. And that's cold composting. Can you do that in a barrel? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, you can do it. The bigger the container, you want to try to do at least three and a half feet by three and a half feet. But so the almost like the, the trash bins that we Right, have. right. And that's what you can buy. That's, what, that's about the size they sell those tumblers, are about that size. Yeah? So can you have too much of one thing? So like if you load it up with paper towels? Right. It it'll, take, it'll take longer. The, the uh, specialists at the state uh, recommend three to one. So the, the brown, these are called browns. This, these are called browns and fresh clippings uh, from your, from your yeah. pulling weeds or uh, trimming your, your shrubs and everything. That's all green. Uh, mowing your lawn, those are green. So the rule of thumb is three browns to one green. So if you, don't, if you have too much brown, it takes longer to decompose. But if you have too much green, that's when you get that ammonia smell. And that's what people complain about a compost pile stinking. That's, that's where the complaint comes from. So you need to try to get a lot of this in. That's why three to one is the recommended ratio. Do you cover the container? No, it's wide open. I think in your handout there are photographs of my compost piles. So you can, you can see that this just, it's just three-sided, and I just pile everything in. You mentioned um, fish, right? Your shrimp shells, your, your lobster shells, all of that stuff will decompose. Um, clam shells are like, uh, like egg shells. They're all uh, calcium. So you need to break, because they'll take forever. And if you were to have a garden party, and for some reason, a couple of chicken bones ended up in the compost pile. Is that bad? It's not bad at all. Okay. What we have in with respect to composting is a situation where we, again, the, the abusers, don't follow directions. And we do a poor job of just about everything in the garden, over fertilizing, over watering. And in the case of composting, we throw too many meat products in there and don't compost correctly. And as a result, you do get a foul smell in your compost pile and you do attract predators. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it is better not to do that. However, if you have a piece of chicken skin, if you have a piece of fish bone or chicken bone or something like that, just turn it all in and don't worry about it. Don't take the entire turkey carcass and put it on top of the pile. That won't work. I had a question. I throw, I throw leaves and trees yep. into my compost. Yep. But with my grass, I just mulch it. I do not... Perfect. We're going to talk about that. That's perfect. If you turn your meat products into the pile so they're not sitting on top, you won't get any flies. Really? Yeah, you won't. You just, you just won't. Maggots? You won't. Well, yeah. that's you don't. Well, that, no. If you don't get the yeah. flies, you're not going to get the maggots. Right. Are you supposed to mix it around every so often? If you are hot composting, that's the whole idea of hot composting. By turning it on a, like every couple of days or so, you're turning everything up. Um, and it breaks it down faster and it gets hotter. But otherwise, if you do this outside of a bin, right. pile it up. Just pile it up and walk away. Hmm. At the community garden, um, we have in the volunteer side, we have a pile in the back. We throw everything in there in the fall. When we, when we shut the garden down, we just pile it all up. In the spring, we move it over and everything that is decomposed from October through March is compost and we take it and we spread it on the beds. Everything else, Everything else goes back into the pile. And then we spend the summer piling it up. Get rid of leaves. I have piles that it takes about three, four years before they even First of all, run it through the lawnmower. Hmm? Run them through the lawnmower to break it up. 
and then just put it in a pile, but make sure you mix some soil in it. You want to preseed it. You know how you can buy those packages of, of uh, compost starter? Uh -huh. That's your soil. So if you have a healthy soil uh -huh. with these hundreds of trillions of microbes in it, you just take that, a couple of shovelfuls of that, throw it, and mix it in with your leaves that you ran through the lawnmower. Right, that's what I'm saying. So if you have a, a couple of pieces and you bury it in the compost pile, you'll be fine. If you have too much and you have that odor, then you're going to draw predators. Mm -hmm. Like you have something that's like the compost that's already started and you put new things in, you throw a little bit of the old compost on top of it and it covers it. Right. And, then, oh. and that's essentially what I do. Yeah. When I, when I harvest the compost pile, everything that's on top of the pile I'm harvesting that didn't decompose goes into the other bin. So in the process of doing that, all of my compost starter is going into that pile. And then I harvest what's left, and then I start all over again. How often do you empty that container? Well, we do so much that it's about a, every day. I make coffee every day, yeah. you're know, eating vegetables, and so it's pretty much every day. Okay. So if you get a healthy soil with a lot of compost in it, your blight problem will diminish. Nice. Okay. But you've got to get that soil worked in. And the best way to work is, well, first of all, compost is the universal neutralizer. So your composted material automatically comes out in the sweet spot. It automatically comes out in the sweet spot. So you just add it to the soil and walk away. And it's loaded with nutrients, and it's loaded with more microbes, and it joins all the other hundreds of trillions of microbes that are in the soil, and everybody's happy. And again, the relationship between good microbes to bad microbes is 30,000 to one. When I have a problem with a diseased plant, the recommendation is to do what? Throw it away. And my argument is, why are you sending a problem to the landfill? Mm -hmm. Throw it into your compost pile and let the good microbes beat up the bad microbes and then put it in the soil. One of our biggest problems in, the, in production farming is we have spent so much time trying to control the weeds in the farm that we've used so many chemicals and we've done so much damage to the soil that even the plants that we're trying to grow the food crops are having trouble because the soil has become diminished and is no longer healthy. If we spent more time taking care of the soil, we'd have less problems growing the crops. Now it's easy for me to say because I only have a, the community garden is only about the size of this room. So I'm not talking about 100 acres of, hundreds of acres of farmland. But still, even the farmers today are starting to recognize they're resting the fields, they're incorporating organic material, they're trying to become more organic. Any questions about composting? No? Anybody want to get into a debate about chemical farming versus organic farming? <laughs> Good. Good. All right. Pruning. Now let's stop. Let's do lawn care first because somebody asked that question. So what is a lawn? What? What is a lawn? Somebody says something. Yes. Okay. We have to. We have to change batteries and tape. By, by the way, you guys are all going to be in BCAT. Any questions? We can talk. Any questions right now? Um, I have a question about starting to compost. How would you begin? Would you suggest just starting really small? Um, first of all, just find an area that you, you really don't spend a lot of time in uh -huh. so that you don't have to keep moving the compost pile. Yeah. So just find a dead spot in your yard. And it, it doesn't have to be in full sun. It doesn't have to be in full shade. It doesn't have to be under the, the shed. or any, it just, just an area where it can sit because it, it has nothing to do with the amount of sunlight or anything else. It has everything to do with the microbes. So just find a place.
pull, when you're pulling weeds and everything out of the soil, you're pulling up soil with it. So you're pulling up microbes with it and you're throwing it into the compost pile. So you're already creating an environment. How much sifting do you have to do of your compost? I mean, your jar that you sent around was like... That was sifted. Was so when, I'm, when I am, when I am, do I need a change too? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I need to get re rebooted. <laughs> so when, when I'm using the compost for my um, container pots, It doesn't. It doesn't. And actually, um, I don't even use that. This is my sister-in-law gave me this about 12 years ago, and I use it for demo purposes. I have a metal beaker, an aluminum, um, no, stainless steel beaker, from back when my first was a co-op student. Photosynthesis temperatures. So what happens is, in the spring, in early March, one of them begins to green up. And then over the course of six weeks, the other two begin to green up. And now during April, May, June, they're all fat, dumb, and happy. But in a couple of weeks, the temperature is going to go above the optimal photosynthesis range of the different grasses. And they're going to get tired. And they're going to want to rest. And they're going to brown out. They're going dormant. And they go dormant through the month of July until the end of August. And then it starts to get cool again, and they start growing again. Because it's cool, and they'll continue to grow until now, with the changes in our climate, we're mowing the lawn into December and January. I actually mowed the lawn last January. It's crazy. So we have two growing cycles in a period where the lawn wants to rest. It wants to go brown, goes dormant. What we are doing is forcing that lawn that wants to sleep to grow. And we do that by putting in more fertilizer and watering when it doesn't want to grow. What that does is weaken the plant. Once the plant becomes weak and is no longer healthy, that is when it is susceptible to a disease or an, or an insect attack. Conversely, go down to Florida and they grow things like um, St. Augustine grass and Bermuda grass, which up here we call crabgrass. So their lawns, their beautiful manicured lawns down there are what we call weeds up here. Right. So what you're going to see now and you're already seeing is the crabgrass is beginning. The warm season plants are beginning to germinate. So you're already seeing the crabgrass starting to grow. Okay. So what we want to do with the lawns is actually help them out. And the best thing you can do to help the lawn out is not fertilize. Use a mulching mower like you're saying. When the summer comes, stop watering. You're just asking for trouble. When the weeds begin to grow, these are annual weeds. So what do we already know about annual plants? From the very beginning, right? They grow, get fertilized, have children, and die in one growing season. So if we keep mowing the brown lawn and, and instead cut the weeds and prevent the weeds from going to seed, Will we have weeds the following year? No, because we killed them all. Now, there's a couple of gazillion weed seed in the lawn already, so you're always going to have some, but just the idea is just keep mowing the lawn even though you have weeds there. Now, we have perennial weeds and we have uh, annual weeds in the, in the lawn, right? So in the spring, we have 
the dandelion, big, big deal, right? Mm. We have to curse our forefathers for bringing them over from Europe. There were no dandelions until the colonials came here. But they're perennials, and what they have is a tap root that looks like a carrot. And we already know that the root system stores energy. So if we do not remove enough of the root system, it comes back. So you see a lot of people up there. The best way to do that is I, I go on a dandelion safari every spring. I decided this about eight years ago because I got fed up. Um, so I took a long handle fork, right? we call it a pitch fork. It's a long handle fork in a five gallon bucket. And I walked around the yard. And all you do is you take that fork, you go about four inches away from the dandelion, line, push it in all the way, pop it up, and you'll pop almost the whole tap root up with it. Take it, throw it in that five gallon bucket. So I did that 20 minutes a night for five nights. I filled up seven buckets with dandelions and other perennial weeds, and I threw them in the compost pile. Now, I get about a dozen dandelions a year. But it was that first year of going out and walking around the whole yard. But get rid of them before they go to seed. Get the whole tap root out and compost them. So now, instead of being a pain in the butt, they're feeding my plants, my flowers and vegetables. About four, inches, about four inches away from where the, the yeah. weed is, yeah. as far down as you can go, and then toggle up. And what you're actually doing is pulling up a big clump of soil. Mm -hmm. So in the process of popping the weed out, you're also aerating the soil. So once you get the weed out, just kind of tamp it down a little bit, the soil down a little bit, and walk away. That's a spring shore. My father used to have a tool this Yep. That's, that's Janet's favorite tool. <laughs> the big thing with this, the idea of this is you have a tap root, and the tap root has a bunch of lateral roots growing off of it. So the idea of this fork is this needs to be sharp. So you're always sharpening your tools. So the idea of this is you run it down along the tap root to break all of those lateral shoots, and then the plant should pop right up. This is also good if you have a dandelion growing in amongst your irises or your daylilies. Yeah. You need something like this because you don't want to plunk, pull the whole yeah. plant up. So you use this. And there's a lot of great tools. The other thing is if you, especially in your vegetable garden, because you're not mulching your vegetable plants, uh, if you just take your trowel, just use this to scrape along the top of the soil. So right now, your, your planting beds are starting to turn green. That's all those baby weeds that have germinated. So just take your trowel and scrape the soil. Just do that. And that'll, that addresses your weed problem. Better to do that now than have to get down on your hands and knees in about three weeks and pull all the weeds out individually. Better to, to damage the root system now by doing something like that. Is that, that. like daily? No, no. Just when you when you're out in the garden, okay. you know, do this. If you have, if you have a hoe, mm -hmm. a shuttle hoe, or some shuffle hoe, that does the same thing. Okay. Best time to start a lawn is the fall, because the lawn grows through two growing seasons. If you start a lawn in the spring, the grass is not going to get thick enough, and the weed seed we'll get a lot of sun exposure. Weed seed um, germinates in direct sunlight, so it germinates on the surface of the soil. So if, if, you sow, if you start a lawn in the spring, you still have a lot of brown area because the, gr the grass is not nice and thick. You get a lot more weeds in your lawn if you start a lawn in the spring. If you start it in the fall, you get two growing seasons before the weeds get to germinate. And you can, if you go online or read books, you can see the difference between a lawn started in the spring and a lawn started in the fall. And this lawn with all those weeds that have germinated takes a lot longer to address the weed problem than if you start a lawn in the fall. Always mow the lawn 
Try not to let it get too tall and let the grass grow to seed. Mow it a little bit taller. The optimum height is about three inches for the three different grasses. So about three inches in the spring, just to get a lot of the dead stuff out, a little lower. In the fall, a little lower when it's cooler. And then put the lawnmower away. Mulch, use a mulching mower. Leave, leave the leaves there so that they decompose and go back and feed the microbes. It's all about the microbes. It's always about the microbes. It's not about us. <laughs> I got a question for you. If you're going to decompose the uh, leaves by chopping them up and leaving them on the grass, is there a point where you could have too many leaves and therefore kill the soil? Kill things? Um, if, you, if you can't seed a lawn because so many leaves are falling, you probably want to run them over and rake them up a little bit. Okay. But toward the end of the uh, season when there's only a few leaves in the grass, just run the mower and forget about it. They will break down and feed the soil. You don't have to kill yourself. You know, the other good thing is if you grow a lot of herbaceous perennials like I do, so I do peony, lilies, daylilies, everything that dies back to the ground. If you cut all of those down early in the fall when they die back, then all the leaves that fall off will blow right out of your yard into your neighbor's yard. <laughs> Any questions about lawns? We have something that my husband calls red thread. Red thread, okay. It's a, it's a probably a, a bacteria or a virus. Okay. So any suggestions how to get rid of it? Uh, well, I, again, um, you get a lot of organic material in there. You can start with a basic solution of, we got a, we got a thing in there called, I call it a um, happy spray. A feels good spray. Mm -hmm. So any anything that you're doing, any pesticides or uh, any kind of uh, spraying that you do in the garden, you should always include some uh, dish detergent. And this detergent, by the way, does not contain any phosphates. Um, you should use dish detergent as a wetting agent. So it, it breaks the magnetic bond that the water molecules have. It breaks that so that whatever you apply spreads across everything. So if you try, you can try this with either ammonia or with um, bleach, whichever you prefer. Don't do ammonia and bleach together. <laughs> One or the other, try with this. The mix is in, it's like, it works out to about a third of a cup of each to a gallon of water. And just see if that's enough to kill it. If it isn't, you may have to start working your way up, but at least this is the least invasive method that you can use. Yeah? I have two questions. One, will that kill like poison ivy? No. Here's what you want to do with poison ivy. Because it is a problem in town with the climate change that isn't happening. Um, it is a problem in town. And we have a big problem at the community garden now. So the uh, online solution for things like poison ivy is a gallon of white vinegar with a cup of salt in liquid dish detergent to coat the leaves. And you pour, it is actually um, an herbicide. And here's why it works. We already talked about osmosis. So when you put all of that salt down, you make the soil saltier than the weeds. So that's going to stop the water flow into the, into the weed. But the white vinegar has a pH of 2.5, which is out here somewhere. This chart starts at 4.0. So you can already see that at 4.0, the plant is not able to take up any nutrients. Right, you see that? So if you have a pH that's out here, there's no way the plant's going to be able to survive. So it's going to stop osmosis and it's going to prevent the plant from absorbing any nutrients and it'll kill it. So you spray the leaves? Spray the leaves. It's going to fall into the soil anyway also. to spray that whole area. You said a gallon of vinegar and a cup of salt, so how much is this detergent? Okay. <laughs> One tablespoon. I wrote it, I wrote it down. Right, no water. Because the water will dilute the vinegar. Yeah? As, as, oh, there's a question on the lawn. So the, um, 
um, if you have like a sparse lawn, right? And it's, so say you planted it in the spring, yeah. And there's a lot of weeds and there's like not much grass, right? How? What do you? Can you just put down grass? Seed? I've tried a million times to just put down grass seed and it, it never works. Well, if you're, if you're putting it down and it's never working, it's probably because the soil doesn't have enough organic material in it. You may want to, before you put it down, spread some cow manure or compost if you can have it. Use your fork. You don't have to till the whole thing, but break it up about a couple of inches down, rake it all out, and then plant your grass seed. But get some organics into the soil. Loose up the soil too. Get the air in there. And if you're starting in the spring, and you want to get a quick lawn up, use a annual ryegrass and then overseed again in the fall. So you'll get the lawn up right away. It'll be green all summer. It's gonna die during, the, during the, this hot season. Come back a little bit in the spring, but it won't overwinter. So come August, then put down your perennial grasses. Or I could just wait till the fall. I'll just wait till the fall. But work, before you seed, work the grass, the, the soil up with some organics and, and aerated a little bit. So you only have to go down a couple of inches, just break it up a little bit. Yeah. One thing about treating poison ivy, I, poison ivy grows in the shade. Right. So if you can expose the year to sunlight, you're going to minimize a lot of it. Yeah. Well, it doesn't really matter. This year it's taken off. Yeah, I think poison I, ivy is full sun all day. It loves it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the trouble well, is it's on my neighbor's side. Well, you know, this is... This, this is a good point. You, you hear them talk, it, poison ivy prefers a shade. There's no such thing as a shade-loving plant. There's no such thing. In order to make sugar, you need the energy of the sun. So they shade-loving plants by virtue of where they were native to, which in some cases is under the tropical rainforest, canopy of trees, they're just by force, by acclimation, to have become something that grows in the shade. Doesn't mean they're a shade-loving plant. It just means that's what that's where they became acclimated. I know one thing. I had a stockade fence. I took it down. I put a picket fence in, and the poison ivy disappeared. And uh -huh. I, got, I got it full sun all day. Yeah, <laughs> could be. It could be a number of reasons. Maybe you actually pulled the roots out in the process of just putting that that up. Who knows? Oh yeah, well, I think we've all I think we've all had poison ivy more than once at some point. Any other questions about lawns? I'm not. One quick, ants. Like ants. Yeah. Ants are nature's custodians. The downside of putting all that organic material in the soil and letting it mulch the mulch in your lawn is the ants are going to take that, bring it down into their nest. So you're f actually feeding the ants. So if you have ants, that's another sign of a healthy soil. Say, okay. say, great. <laughs> great. And, if, and if you do have a potty and you do have a piece of hot dog or a piece of chicken or something like that, by the next morning they'll be gone. The ants will bring it back to the nest. Right, as long as they stay out of the house. We, any more questions on wines? The best thing you can do with a lawn is turn it and put a planting flower bed in or Jan, Janet just walked in. She'll confirm to you that we've probably dropped an hour per mowing out of our yard by, remo by removing the grass. So there's no need for the water. L let's face it, you can't eat grass. So, so, get, so if I'm not, you know, if, if you're a lawn person and you, you want, that's great. But it's just so much easier when you don't have a have grass to mow. And then you don't worry about the weeds and all that other stuff. Um, Is there ever a time that you should um, collect the grass in the bag or it always mulch it? You should, every once in a while, just kind of stick your finger and try to work your way down to the soil. Uh -huh. And if you have over an inch of, of uh, thatch, yeah. uh -huh. then you probably want to rake it. You could use a thatching mower or something like that. Yeah. And that may be depending on if you bag your lawn um, versus mulching it. If you have a bunch of microbes in the soil versus having no microbes, you may have to do that every couple of years or uh, every 10 years. We do it about every 10 years. 
But yeah, every once in a while, because that prevents the water from percolating into the soil. We go with lawns? Aerating. Should you aerate your lawn? Again, that's, no, th that's a good point. Okay. If you have an area where people have been trampling through, and you, you can see the pathway where they've been oh, yeah. pressing the oxygen out of the soil, right. work that in. That's another reason why you should try to change patterns when you mow the lawn every week. Yes. Go back and forth one time, across another time, diagonally, go in circles, just keep rotating it. You know, like they, like they do Fenway Park, changing the... Right. So just, yeah. that just changes your walking pattern so you don't keep stepping in the same spot all the time. Anything else? Okay, pruning. Again, I got bad news. You only prune for the health of the plant. You do not prune to create little Dumble the elephant and beach balls and all that other stuff. That is not why you prune. You prune for the health of the plant. When you prune incorrectly, you create an environment within the plant that stimulates disease and insect growth. And you weaken the plant. So you have a weakened plant, and then you have all of these diseases and insects, and they're going to attack the plant. So you need to prune correctly for the health of the plant. If you want to have, what's, what is that? Making Dumble the Elephant and everything. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. If you're going to do that, go buy a fake one and put it in a pot <laughs> and you know, put a sign up, you know, Dumble the Elephant, and maybe put some lights on it. But don't, you, don't destroy your plants because you think you should have this. You want these Roman pillars made out of arborvitae saying, come into my yard. You're not, you're not helping the plant by doing that. If you just use, if you just use a pruning shear, a hedge trimmer, yeah. this is what you create. So you have, this, is, this was um, out of a fascithia that the, the stem was probably this high all the way down. So all of this is completely barren of leaves. So this was one pruning with the hedge trimmer. This was another pruning with the hedge trimmer, another pruning with the hedge trimmer, and it just goes on and on and on. So eventually you have this canopy of solid green and nothing underneath. It's all about efficiencies with the plant. So if none of these leaves were getting any sunlight, they were not performing photosynthesis, they weren't producing sugar, the plant is not going to waste its time by having those leaves, so it drops the leaves. These fall to the base of the plant. This is completely surrounded with this canopy, and inside here you get nothingness. It rains, it gets hot, and it's hot and muggy in here, and that's where the diseases. So you've probably, like in August, you probably brushed against a shrub that you pruned like that and saw the fly, the insects fly out. Did you ever have that? Or you saw the puff of smoke? Or maybe you, the plant, the shrub got so wide you had to cut it back and you saw the nothingness? That's what you're creating. This is not a healthy environment for the plant. I'm going to tell you. <laughs> First thing you need to do is have at least three pruning shears, three pruning tools. At the very least, in your bag, you should have these three tools. The very least. This is a bypass pruner. This is a bypass pruner. This is the blade. This is the anvil. And as I prune, the blade passes by the anvil. You see how that's going? Mm -hmm. This is for pruning live wood. Because you can slice live wood. But if you have dead branches and you try to prune with that, you only get a little ways in and the blade sticks 
and sometimes it twists and sometimes it turns and that's how you break your wrist. And a couple of days later you say to your, your spouse, I don't, what's, I don't know what happened, my wrist is killing me because you're cutting dead wood. You need this kind of a pruner. This is an anvil pruner and it works where the blade presses against the anvil. What this does is pinches the dead wood and snaps it. So this is what you use on dead wood. But even on dead wood, this only goes up to about a half an inch. Then you need something bigger. And then you should have a pruning saw. And by pruning saw, I don't mean that big bow saw that's 24 inches long. When you're pruning, you're pruning for the health of the plant. And if you do more damage to the plant while you're trying to make it healthy, you're defeating the purpose. So you should have one of these saws. Because this will get inside the crevices and everything, allow you to remove the branches that you're trying to take out without doing more damage to the plant. So is that used mostly on the dead wood? Both. Oh, both. Both. So you want a pruning saw. And the best thing is, this is a replaceable blade, um, but the best thing is um, having, having a tool that you can take apart and you expose the blade. But you should also have in your tool bag, everybody has a tool bag, right? You, right? Everybody has a gardening bag? I know you say yes. No, don't say no. Say yes. Yes, yes I do. You, sh you, should all, yeah, you should always have all of your tools readily available because if you don't, you typically, you're working, oh, I need something, you go get the other tool, and then what happens is you forget that you left the pruning shears or some hand tool on the ground, and then the next spring when you come out, you get this rusty. Yeah. So anyway, you should always have also a pruning stone just to sharpen the blade. And this is something you should do in the spring before the gardening season, while you're waiting for the season. Take these apart, clean them, and sharpen the blade just to make a shot because the sharper it is the easier you don't again want to be doing this and if it gets dull again it twists while you're cutting and you your wrist you break your wrist and then you complain about needing to wear a brace or whatever the rule of thumb people heal h-e-a-l when we get a cut a wound it heals plants are not able to do that when the wood is exposed, this is 100% dead. So when the wood is exposed to the elements, it will immediately start to decay. So people heal, but plants seal, S-E-A-L. So if you do a proper pruning, what will happen is, remember way back I said we have these lazy Mirror stem cells sitting at the notch, at the node of a plant. So when there is a cut, a wound, chemically this message goes out, we got, we got an uh, opening, we have to seal the opening, seal, seal, seal. So these marrow stem cells immediately become wood cells, or bark cells, and they begin to close off the wound. And you'll see this all over town. You go all over town now, you'll see these things. Right, any tree that's been cut down, you'll actually see the, the wound S-E-A-L-ing, <laughs> sealing, okay? The key, the key is not cutting too close and removing the mirror stems. Here's a better example, how it closes. If you cut too much off, like here, I took everything off, all of the latent mirror stems were removed and this never would have sealed. Okay, pass those around, take a look at it. So when you are pruning, the first rule of thumb is prune to a node. Prune back to a node, don't prune in the middle because if you prune in the middle, there are no latent mirror stems to seal the wound. So always prune back to a node where those latent meristem cells are, the growth cells are, okay? This is why you prune. This was a tree branch hanging up about 12 feet in the air 
and I was watching the DPW cutting the branch down. I went over and took it. The reason they had to cut it down. So it got a wound, and it was not able to seal the wound, even though you can see how it tried to seal the wound. Right? Here's the old bark. Here's the new bark. You can see it trying to seal the wound. But it was not able to seal the wound. So while you had a couple of hundred pounds of tree branch, about 12 feet in the air, completely rotten. So what would have happened is had they left it there, it would have rotted out so much by the, by the base of the tree that the 500 pounds or so would have just dropped down, snapped right off. No problem if nobody's around, but we had uh, an adult and a child two years ago get killed from falling branches. That's what they call widow makers. Not the whole tree. When they say a tree fell down, they don't mean the entire tree. They're talking about something like that falling. Yep. If you prune incorrectly and you don't prune back to a node, what you end up with is when a tree is small, when a tree is small, this is the trunk of the tree. This is the base where the little um, branch grew off the trunk of the tree. Each one of these rings is the tree getting fatter and fatter and fatter. And each one of these rings is the branch getting thicker and thicker and thicker. But the branch goes all the way to the base of the tree. So what you have is the entire tree holding up the branch. But if you don't prune back to this node, you just get a bunch of branches growing off the side of the stem. So there's no support all the way in. And if these branches reach, you know, 100 pounds or so, they're just going to snap and fall right off. So what happened here is the homeowner just cut the top of a maple tree off, just removed the top of a maple tree. The bark is gone. The, the hard, the dead wood was exposed, and the first thing that happened was insects moved in. The wood got soft, insects moved in. Once the insects moved in, the woodpeckers had at it. And once the woodpeckers had at it, they made a house. Right? So you had this situation. Now, this was only sitting like that, no big deal. But again, if this were something that's a couple of feet in diameter, and if you drive around town, you'll see some of these, and it's all rotted out, what do you think is going to happen to that tree? And then you see it on the news, and it hits somebody's house or whatever. These people, we have known this was a problem. It's been a problem with all these power outages for the last five, six years, and people still leave the trees up. They don't take them down. Let somebody else worry about it. All right, so. Pruning for the health of the plant. The first thing you need to do because plants have to seal themselves off is you remove all broken and dead branches. Broken and dead branches automatically. You don't have a choice. If they're broken or they're dead, you cut them off. Because again, here's the box sealing, preventing the insects and the diseases from getting in, but here's the dead wood where it ripped allowing the insects and diseases to get in. The next thing you do is remove all crossing branches. So for instance, if you have a few uh, rose bushes, they always tell you to remove crossing branches. That's to let sunlight into the center of the rose bush so that those leaves continue to produce sugar through the process of photosynthesis and they stay there. This was, a, this was a shrub, and these branches were just sitting one on top of the other. And what happened in the process is the bark came off. Now, again, the wood is exposed. And once the wood is exposed, insects and diseases get in. That is not so much a problem when it's down here, but when you have trees where the branches are crossing over and rubbing, it's rubbing all the bark off, and it does this for years and years and years. And in the meantime, this branch is getting heavier and heavier and heavier. Eventually, it's going to snap. 
You also will notice if you walk around town, you'll see some trees growing, leaning on another tree, or leaning on a stockade fence, or, and you'll see the tree growing around the fence. That branch should have been removed years ago, because that's going to snap and fall. So dead and broken branches, crossing branches, once you do that, and then you start pruning for the shape of the tree, or the shrub, or whatever. But it's a step-by-step -step process. And again, when you're at the end of it, it should not look like Dumbo the elephant, or a, a, a beach ball, or anything like that. Is, yep? Is there a special time that you should be doing the pruning? Good question. When, when should you be pruning? All spring flowering evergreens, everything that blooms in the spring, should be pruned immediately after, but no later than early August. So for instance, your rhododendrons, yeah. your azaleas, Lilac. lilacs, they should all be pruned now. They finished, they finished blooming. Yeah. You should be cutting those dead flowers off, deadheading anyway, because if you don't cut them off and the seed was fertilized, then what you have is seed growing in the pods on the plant. So all the energy is going there instead of into the soil for next year's bloom. So you should cut them off now. Come the end of August, the chemical process takes place where the shrub is beginning to prepare itself for winter. So it begins to harden off. So at that point, it has already uh, developed next year's flowers. So you'll see in August, you'll begin to see um, the big flower head for the, rhododend for the uh, rhododendron. If you look real close at your facitia, you'll see at each of the nodes where the leaf is, you'll see the flower buds. Same thing on the azaleas. So you'll see all your spring flowering shrubs will have the 2000, what year is this? 20? 19. 2020, 19 or 20? It's 19. The 19. <laughs> You're supposed to keep me up to date. You're not doing your job. <laughs> so next year's flowers will be on the shrubs and have to overwinter in order to bloom next in order to bloom next spring. Again, going way back to the, one of the first questions about your hydrangeas, those buds form in the fall and they bloom in the spring, but because of this climate changes that's going on, they're freezing over the winter and dying. Always go back to a node. Always go back to a node. Just keep telling yourself, go back to a node. So you follow, take your rhododendron yeah. and just follow that whole branch. So you got a big, and your rhododendron, you got a big thing like this at the top. Work your way down and eventually you'll get to something like this and go into it. And you can see like right there, that's a, that's a node right there. So cut right there. I'll go further down, cut right there. So you can actually go into the plant, cut it, and pull the entire thing out. The, the shrub will get smaller, and all of the other branches that were bunched up, trying to grow against this, will expand and fill the hole. So after you remove this, you'll look at the shrub, and no one will even know you cut it. You pruned it. See right here? Okay. okay. And see right, right there? Yeah. And right there? Yeah. Okay. Those are nodes. So can you cut right there? You could cut right there. Okay. All right here? Yep. Okay. Yep. And I'm focused on um, trim my, my shrubs. And uh, <laughs> what I was going to do is what you told me. You just told us not to do it. Well, <laughs> I, I have an area that's it's now about 50 feet of, of stupid me. I planted um, Fasitia as a hedgerow. Instead of a privet, so I have a Fasitia hedgerow. Fasitia doesn't want to be a hedgerow. It wants to be this nice cascading. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I have a hedgerow. So now what I have to do is every spring after I prune it with the hedge trimmer, I go in and I cut some of these out, only like a third of them. I just keep cutting them out on a regular basis, so I don't end up with a bunch of this. So I still have sunlight getting into the shrub, and I'm, I'm, I'm just. 
you know, I'm asking a facitia to do it or what doesn't want to do. So I violated everything I told you not to do. Well, like my father used to say, do what I say, not what I do. So you can just, if you have a hedge trimmer, yep. like, you can just go along the top and around it if you want. So you, you can, but at, some, but at some point doing that, at some point you need to then stand back and, and thin some of these out. As part of the exercise, use your hedge trimmer, but as part of the exercise of pruning, thin some of these out. Because eventually, if you just continue to use the hedge trimmer, at some point, you have to shrink it down. Some people put a hedgerow going up the front walk, right? So it grows into the front walk, and instead of two people being able to walk there, it's only one person wide. So you take the hedge trimmers and you cut them way back, and now you just have a wall of wood, right? So in order to prevent that from happening every few or four or five years, just every, once in, every year, take some of these out, remove some of these as part of the, trim, the prim, trimming process. Any guidance for uh, trimming plants back away from the side of a house? Same thing. Same thing. Same thing. Start, but go all the way down. Just as long as you go back to a node, you'll be fine. That's where, that's where the meristem cells, the growth cells, are sitting there waiting to do something. So take it back to that, that area and the cells will seal the wound. I know we have a friend who uh, had these huge pine trees over, overgrowing their driveway. So I went out with her husband and the two of us, we just started working it back, just back and forth along the, the trees. We just kept going back to a node, back to a node, back to a node. And eventually we, sh we pushed the trees back, but they still looked like pine trees. So it's just, it's just, and it, it's practice. It's practice, but it's just back to a node, back to a node, and keep reminding yourself, I'm not doing this because I want it to look pretty. I'm doing it for the health of the plant. Because if the plant is healthy, you don't have any worries. You don't have any problems. Okay? Any questions about pruning? Animals. Who is... What is the biggest pest in your garden? Rabbits. <laughs> we are responsible for 80% of our problems. Mm -hmm. We don't prune properly. We over fertilize. We don't cut the lawn properly. We don't build a fence around our plants that we don't want the rabbits and the woodchucks to eat. We are responsible for 80%. We don't prepare the soil before we plant. We are. O-H-A is other household adult. It used to say spouse, but now we got to you know, be... You know how it is. When you cross into this zone, you actually start to reverse the problem. That's why these are smaller. Because when you're talking about wildlife, there are just as many predator animals as there are woodchucks and rabbits. And when you get down to insects, there are even more predatory insects and bugs than there are bad guys. And we already know when you get down to the disease problems, the percent of good microbes ratio is 30,000 to 1. So we know the microbes will help us here. So it's really up to us to take care of our own problems, which means that if you have a, having a problem with an area where you're growing, growing plants, you, it's, whatever it might be, they're just not growing healthily, they just, you get a lot of weeds amongst them and everything like that. Well, when you dig up the plants, in the case of daylilies, it's like every five years or six years. In the case of irises, it's about every four to five years. Peonies, it's every 10 years. Whenever you are digging up a, a flower bed, that's the time to remove all of the weeds and all of the root, the weed roots, and incorporate as much compost as you can into the soil. That's the time to, to feed the microbes and make the soil healthy. And then you, you put your plants back in. If you have flowers, I mean vegetables, 
and you know you're attracting rabbits and woodchucks and things like that, you need to have a fence. For rabbits, a 28 inch chicken wire rabbit fence is fine. For woodchucks, you have woodchucks are fat squirrels. That's what they are, fat squirrels. They climb. You, it is not unusual to see a woodchuck sitting in a tree. They climb. So if you, doesn't matter how high your fence is, which is typically four feet, woodchucks will climb over it. So what you need to do is make a flimsy fence. So if you have a fence, try to put something outside. I went out and bought a plastic fencing, like a snow fence, and I put it out about four inches from the regular garden fence, and I just used some snow stakes you know the little thin poles? I use those to hold up the, the plastic fence so when the woodchuck tries to climb the fence, it just collapses on them. You can see that if you go to the, to the volunteer garden at Francis Wyman, you can see that fence. We have the regular fencing, then we have smaller rabbit fencing, and then on the outside we have the plastic fencing for the woodchucks. Last year we had, a, two years ago, we had 11 rabbits and woodchucks in the garden. Last year we didn't have any. This year, Hopefully, same thing. But you need multiple defenses. The other thing which works great, especially for rabbits, is this. Black plastic. If you run the black plastic along the outside bottom of your fencing, your garden, let's say that's the rabbit, your garden becomes invisible. I know a lot of people say, can't they smell and all? Yeah, they probably could, but they're looking around and all they're seeing is black. <laughs> this is something I thought I was a genius about 10 years ago. I was sitting in the back porch watching a bunch of rabbits trying to get into the garden, and they're talking to each other. You find a way in, you find a way in. No, oh, uh, one ran this way, one ran that, all the way around the garden, came back. Did you find anything? No, no, did you find anything? No. They switched places, kept running. They did it about two or three times, trying to figure out how to get into the garden. I went, Wait a minute, still, I put this up, and a week later, they're, they're outside eating my li lilies, <laughs> but at least they're not trying to get into the garden. So I made it still. I thought I was a genius until I, I, I collect a lot of old gardening books. So I'm reading a book from the 1960s, put up black plastic. So it's a, it's a solution that we forgot about. Because, well, because we got, into, we got into chemicals and stuff like that. So this, yes? Well there, well, there is a weed, this, this is solid plastic. There is a weed blocker that, that porous so water can get in. But the only problem with a weed blocker is that still the weeds are going to, seed are going to blow in and come in from someplace else. So you're always going to have weeds. Not as much though, correct. Correct. So in order to keep the, the woodchucks and the rabbits out of the garden, you need, you need proper fencing. You have to do things like this. And this is a great solution. You put it up in the spring, at least with the rabbits. The woodchucks always seem to find their way in. So you, do, you still have to have some kind of traps and follow the Massachusetts regulations which say that if you catch the animal on your property, you either have to release it someplace else on your property on your property, you are not allowed by law to take it over to the Knoblon Moffis Park and release. <laughs> or you have to do the nasty, um, and you have to do that humanely, which is why a lot of people call exterminators or. Can you call the animal control officer? No. <laughs> Because they're going to read chapter 23, whatever. <laughs> um, there are other solutions, and you have one in your, in your thing, but these don't really work that well. Um, there are repellents. This one is a uh, shake-away uh, um, predator pellant. So this is either fox urine, a synthetic fox urine, or wolf urine, or something like that coyote urine. Doesn't work at all because when you're hungry, you're hungry. That's it. All this says is, is don't come in my yard, I will eat you. And after a while when the rabbits don't see or the woodchucks don't see any coyotes or 
anybody else that's a predator in your yard, they're going to try to kind of ignore that. But it is a solution. It is a solution. And it's, and it's, it's a synthetic urine, predator urine. And humans are predators. Humans are predators. And I'll just leave it there. The other, the other solution, the other repellent is a uh, taste repellent. And what it is is a bunch of herbs mixed with uh, mints. So you, you puree it, strain it, add some hot sauce to it, the whole bit, and you put that out. And that says, don't eat me, I don't taste good. But what I've found from the chipmunks in Burlington is they have a, they have a taste for spicy food. <laughs> So that doesn't work. I came in from Mexico. The only thing you can do with chipmunks is um, take a five gallon bucket, fill it halfway up with water, put a stick up to the top of the bucket with a couple of sunflower seeds at the top of the stick and a handful of sunflower seeds in the bucket. The chipmunk will walk up, eat the two seeds, look in, Mother load, <laughs> and then over that that compost pile that you're going to start this year. Well, that's that's what this is for. That's what this is for. You reach into the bucket. I know, I know. But when you're sitting when you're sitting on your porch, and your tomato plant in the container is growing and it's right here. And the chipmunk comes walk right up and says, hi, how you doing? And proceeds to eat your flowers yeah. with the fruit at the base of it. Then you'll have a different opinion. And this year we have a large amount of chipmunks. So you go to your, you go to your compost pile. You dig one shovel full deep. Cover it up. Say a little prayer. Thank the chipmunk from be, for becoming future compost. Okay. You also have um, a large number of uh, home brews. So there's some, there's some other formulas and things in, in the back. Uh, there's some rules of thumbs. There's all kinds of information. Are there any questions about anything that we discussed tonight? No? Everybody's good? Yep. This, this should be no reason to, to put any kind of amendment like that into the compost pile. There shouldn't, really shouldn't be a reason to do that. The only time you want to use, use lime is when you need to make adjustments in the soil. For instance, we, in order to uh, grow potatoes, potatoes want the pH of the soil to be down in blueberry range, four and a half pH. So you need to lower the pH of that soil. But then the following year, because you rotate your crops, you're going to put something else in there that may not want that lower pH. And if you don't have enough organic material in there, you, you may have to adjust it by adding some lime. But there's no real reason to put anything like that into a compost pile. All right. Well, that was 2 hours and 45 minutes. Oh, you got a question? Yes! <laughs> I don't see why it would hurt the plant. Uh, there's a lot of home brews, you know, the, the uh, little dish with the, with the beer for slugs and everything. Yeah. You know, you can drown, the, the slugs will crawl in and drown. So there are a lot of home brews. Um, some of those, those fly catchers with the, where you put the, uh, yeah, I mean, all, they all work. Uh, they're, they're all labor intensive. You know, my, again, going all the way back to what I said at the beginning, my whole thing is to try to minimize my time in the yard. Yeah. So my focus is on making the soil um, as, as alive as possible so the plants can, can grow in a healthy environment. A healthy plant will take care of itself. A couple of antidotes. Um, when a plant is in the rest, it releases hormones to notify all the other plants that something's happening and that triggers the other plants to go alkaloid and increase the amount of toxins within the plant. 
So they, they protect themselves by doing that. And the example that I keep telling people is, you know when you first cut your lawn, you get that nice watermelon smell? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's the hormone that the grass is emitting, saying, this big, ugly guy is killing us. <laughs> that's, the, that's actually the grass under the duress, letting all the other grass plants know that something's going on. So plants are capable of identifying foes and notifying other plants in the area chemically that they need to trigger their defense mechanisms. And usually it's to make the leaves and everything taste bitter. So they can actually kill predators um, you know, by, by themselves without our help. So it's all about you know, keeping, if you create a situation a plant grows by itself happy and healthy, then it'll almost tell you to go away and leave it alone. And that's what you want, yes? Right. And they took it down. There was all these carpenter in there. Right. How do you prevent them from getting into your trees? Well, you don't. Where'd it go? You don't let that happen. You don't let that happen where the bark is removed and it's exposed. That's where the insects and diseases get in. So you had an area in the tree, and it may have been at the ground level. Yes, I don't remember anything wrong with that tree. Well, it may have been at the ground level. It may not have been you, but somebody else mowing the lawn. Bang, 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 and hit the bark and expose the wood. And once the wood is exposed, they're there. They climb in that wood. Yeah, so once the wood was exposed and it got wet, that's, that's carpentry and territory. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. We do a lot of hiking in the Fells Way. Yep. And uh, the number of trees that are down in the Fells Way, yep. it's incredible. And hollowed out. Um, right. We did meet somebody in there one time that talked about a um, beetle infestation yep. that um, is eating away at the right. trees and causing like a little circle. Well, here's the problem we have with forests. If we, don't want, we don't want to thin them out. Trees are nothing but big plants. Uh -huh. So you have the same problem in a forest than you have in your backyard. So you end up with a bunch of these trees growing and you have like 75 feet of trunk with no leaves or anything, or branches, then at the very top is the canopy. Yeah. So that whole area when you're walking through is loaded with you know, molds and insects and everything else. That's, what, that's what's going on there. So we should be culling the woods to keep them healthy. Instead, we prefer to let the trees die and fall and then what they do is they just cut either side of the pathway so you can walk through right. and you get the trunk on one side and the top on the other side and they may even take these pieces, cut them up smaller and create a little walkway, walkway on either side and they leave it there. Well, that's all decaying right where you don't want it to decay. So I, I try, when, you, when you're walking through the woods, you should be walking like this. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Just leave a lot of lichen on a lot of maple trees. Yep. That's, again, that's the sign of the times. Uh, try doing the, uh, either the bleach and, and dish detergent or the uh, ammonia and dish detergent. At least it'll clean some of it off. It's going to hurt the trees if you keep on doing it. No, no. no. Oh, okay. the, the only time you have a problem is when you see mushrooms growing in the tree. Then you already know the tree's dead. Okay. See, oh. the, if you see mushrooms growing on the tree, it's already too late. It's, it got into that light green vascular system and the trees, the trees already, it's a, it's a growing tree dying. <laughs> yes? What, what is? Knotweed, Not yes. Yeah, that's really, that's very invasive. Yeah, you, 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 you gotta get out whenever you see weeds, you gotta address them early. The knotweed is invasive, it's in the, it's in the, the roots. So you gotta just, not just cut the, the vine down, but you also have to dig the roots out if you can. If you can't dig the roots out of any weed that you're trying to get rid of, or any plant you're trying to get rid of, just keep removing the leaves as they grow. You're, eventually you're gonna use up all of the stored energy that's in the roots so just keep cutting and cutting and cutting 
until eventually it just runs out of energy and it won't come back. Do you have to buy anything? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Very yeah. yeah, it's all over the place. There's a, there's a lot of weeds that we have now. Some of them were brought in as, as plants and they've just taken off and the birds eat the berries and go all over the place. Uh, so all, you, all we can do is just stay ahead of the weeds. Get them while they're small so that you don't have to go out there and spend the whole day chopping away. All right? That was three hours. Did it feel like three hours? No. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we're all done. Thank you. If you have any questions, at the bottom of the handout is my email address. So if you have any garden questions, don't, don't hesitate.